and this is my Slovak experience. Hello everyone, today's guest is Anka Dragu. She's a journalist that 18 years ago came from Romania to Slovakia for a media workshop with just a few crowns in her pocket and not a clear idea about her future. And now she's working in the Radio Slovakia International, covering many topics from business to politics, from healthcare to sport. So you can listen to Anka from the radio almost every day, but only here in this podcast you can enjoy her Slovak experience. My apologies in advance for the noise background during the interview. We were in a fairly quiet cafe in Bratislava when we started recording. And at one point, lucky day, someone chose the same cafe to organize a little birthday party for their kids. Anyway, the audio is still very well understandable. There is a good lesson learned for me to choose much more wisely the place for the interview. I hope you will forgive me if from time to time there are some louder sounds. And now I will leave you with Anka Drago. Thank you for listening. I'm uh, here with Anka Drago. Anka, uh, thank you for being here and sharing your Slovak experience. It's my pleasure. You are working in Radio Slovak International, and uh, so in this you you already are in a media area, and also potentially uh, you you already touch very many topics. So we will probably talk at the beginning about you. I would like to start your experience as such, but then probably we can get also to talk about something more and also what what you're doing. Okay. Uh, but let's start from um, where you come from. So you you are from Romania. Right? Yes. So why why Slovakia, and when did you come here? Well, it was by accident, actually. Um, for those of you of listeners who don't know too much about Slovakia's history, Slovakia had a dark period until 1998, mm-hmm. uh, when they had the authoritarian regime of Vladimir Mečar. And um, after he fell from power, there was a lot of money from all sorts of donors coming to Slovakia to support the civil society Mm -hmm. and free media. So one of those projects was to bring uh, journalists from many other countries in Central and Eastern Europe, Romania included, uh, here for a kind of training, a training that lasted uh, about nine months. So this is how I came, uh, and I came by train because everybody asked me how. Everybody asks me how did you come by train on January the sixth, two thousand, and nobody told us that it's a state holiday, a bank holiday in Slovakia. Shops are closed, ah, banks yeah. are closed, and so on. And we came six crazy Romanians by train from um, from Bucharest by night train, and uh, we changed trains in Budapest. So thanks God, my friend who was studying there came to meet me uh, at the railway station at six o'clock in the morning and brought some um, some kind of cake. Uh, so we survived on that cake for the next uh, 12 hours. Was closed <laughs> Everything day. was closed. And we had to go to Modra where we were accommodated. And imagine there were, everything was closed in Bratislava, mm-hmm. um, in Modra. I, even, I mean, the church was open, but otherwise everything was closed. So, yeah, this was the first day. Uh, travel okay. advice, never come on a bank holiday to Slovakia. <laughs> Joking. Well, I mean, maybe m- many things changed since then. So how do you remember uh, the train not station perhaps at that time? Is it the same as now? Excuse me, not everything changed. Uh, last week, my friends did not know that uh, supermarkets are closed on September the 1st. Mm-hmm. So I know a few who queued in front of gas stations to buy some uh, canned tuna yeah. and toilet paper. So no, no, no. Some things never change. Ah, railway station. Look at the same. It's the same. Yep. So Including the Sputnik, you know. 18 on the years ago and now it's uh, the kind, same. Of, kind of the same. The same. Thing. I like the Sputnik. Do you know? Have you seen that? Uh, there yeah. is this like, okay, I like the Sputnik. And also how they were, uh, you know, trying to kick out to evict the bourgeois and they were making friends with uh, black people from Africa. Mm-hmm. How are your first days when you come here? Well, the first one, <laughs> uh, <except laughs> hungry. For the first, but, you know. 
was lovely, but surely we we uh, got accustomed. It wasn't the, it wasn't easy because of course the language barrier and stuff. But we had a person who was in charge. Uh, uh, charge. Uh, but we had a, a person uh, who took care of us, at least to translate. And we had a lot of funny story. Um, we had to go to apply for, of course, for this uh, temporary residency. And they had this like compulsory uh, health checks. And one was for tropical diseases. Our attempts to explain where Romania is on the map uh, went nowhere. So we went, it was January, February, terribly cold in the morning, mm-hmm. you know, we had to travel from Modra by bus. So we went to uh, the building that still exists. Unfortunately, they don't take care of that building, but the building is historical, is yeah. the one here downtown, uh, is part of the medical faculty. And uh, we were just lined up there. And I remember that we had also had to have an eye exam. And of course, so this was because you were there wasn't the European because, Union at that time. In yeah, Romania was not countries. in the European Union, and it was just ridiculous. Anyway, we had an eye exam where yeah, yeah. it was a lot of fun because, of course, we read the letters. You know how an eye exam yes, looks yes, like. Yes. Have the read? We read them in English. You, we read them in Romanian, and uh, the lady concluded that we are useless because none of us could pronounce of course C which is uh, in Slovak yeah, well, and course. so on so it was really funny but she took her job seriously she really did the exam uh, and uh, so a lot of um, bureaucratic stupidities uh, then of course we had to get used to uh, local habits uh, for example we had the last bus to Modra at 11 o'clock and we fell in love with the driver the driver was uh, Mr. Achberger, hello, if he's still working, alive. He was a um, um, hardcore rocker. Mm-hmm. So 11 o'clock, you know, uh, he had a radio with a tape, cassette, because there was no in the CDs in the bus. The bus was old Carosa style, this double bus, mm-hmm. smelling and everything. And he was playing hard rock and it was like really 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 cool and uh, we came for a party once and we got drunk and we were loud so we were louder than his music and he simply stopped the bus in the middle of nowhere in the field between Pezinok and Vinosadi opened the door and said that <laughs> we should get I off our bus <laughs> so we had really like funny stories um, we had some Ukrainian friends and we were hitchhiking to save money and we had one one lady who was like had a lot of sex appeal and usually she was the one hitchhiking and once the garbage uh, you know the garbage uh, machine stopped and we didn't know whether to take it or not so we had a lot of like funny story in this respect otherwise bureaucracy the legendary foreign police and her stupid it's stupid request um, but you you, came, you didn't come to stay right at the beginning no it no was, no no uh, we came for this uh, project <laughs> yes, we, uh, I came for this uh, training or workshop and then I was offered the job or the possibility to, to cooperate with the radio uh, and I said like, why not? I stay. Uh, now if I look back, I think that <laughs> it was really crazy because <laughs> uh, I, I stayed with 7,000 crowns in my pocket, which is now uh, less under, let's say, a bit maybe about 250 euro I can imagine and no real clear uh, clear perspective in terms of a weather because I was like a freelancer so you can't really count the money when you're a freelancer yeah. uh, so I was completely you know uh, as an as, as an adventure and I remember that we had a lot of fun because one of my friends who came with me then we became friends afterwards we, uh, she got married in the Czech Republic and to cross from from Bratislava to go to Bruno at that time we needed a stamp of course because we needed this yeah. visa so I remember that we were like scared that uh, we might our visa might expire before the wedding and stuff like this and um, we managed it then have to have to be on time, but I remember how we were crossing on foot the the border of Rijka just to have our passport stamped and all this kind of stupidities. From uh, from the people you met around, I right? saw so your your experience with the, the relationship with with Slovaks. Right? So except for the bus driver, <laughs> the legend. 
Well, it depends. In time, my impression changed a few times. So at the beginning, you know, uh, when you are a bit younger and you are crazy and it doesn't really matter. Uh, I've always thought that Slovaks are closed people, even until today. So after almost 15 years, how many years? 20 almost. Uh, but I also traveled. So I, I haven't spent 20 years only in Slovakia. I also went to the US to study for a year and a half. I went to London for an internship. So let's say purely Slovakia, 15 years. So in these 15 years, I haven't changed my opinion that they are close, close people. Uh, even if the young generation travels and, uh, let's say, uh, speaks better foreign languages than they spoke in 2000 when we came. Um, so this is one thing which hasn't changed. Then, of course, there were like friendships that went and got, that came and went relationships that came and went mm -hmm. I can't say whether in in my home country would have been different I don't know I don't know because you know how it is you never know it. but I think that one like crossing point was the year 2015 mm -hmm. when the immigration uh, crisis let's call migration crisis affected Europe mm -hmm. and when for me it was a shock to be in Slovakia as a foreigner and I'm not talking about politicians statements uh, but I'm talking about people whom I did not expect making statements about foreigners that they bring uh, disease to Slovakia next to me and at one point I said like what kind of diseases I brought so people I did not expect you know and to me it was shocking to see that under the influence of uh, something that did not even happen here you know, they started to have this idea. I'm sure that you're used to it from some Facebook uh, groups and comments. Yeah. yeah. So this was a, like a, like a, like a strange point, 2015, and I'm still sensitive about it, and I still somehow sometimes have this bad taste. But it's never directed to you, right? It's always or to your particular. It's always uh, the other foreigner, I would say. Right? It's never the one that they are friends to, but is usually, you know, then always the one in the next door. It depends. I mean, if the two of us are on the street and we don't open our mouth, you know, we are white, we look very Slovak. So unless they realize that you are a foreigner, uh, it can be directed to you too, you know, so it's, it's, and then they try to feel, ah, but you are not that kind of foreigner, you know, like, I mean, you're Italian, of you're course, they are welcome here, yeah, because Romania is different, they still don't have a clue about Romania, but mm -hmm. Romanians don't have such a good image like Italians have now, <laughs> compare it. <laughs> there is a ranking of, uh, yeah, there is a ranking, you know, uh, Eastern Europeans, acceptable and not acceptable foreigners, okay. not really, it's like Eastern Europeans still uh, love this, uh, Western Europe, yeah. you know. So, but uh, it's uh, interesting to know that you know there is. You find that there is a significant change after one particular year, uh, due to certain kind of circumstances. But uh, do you think that you know people somehow change their mind, or it's just that it's the hot topic of the moment, so there is more opportunity to talk about it? Um, I don't know. You know how it is. Um, the integration has to be both ways. I mean, foreigners can't integrate by themselves. The Slovak side also has to uh, be welcoming in a way. Like, uh, you know, if we are here in this like courtyard mm -hmm. and uh, we want to make friends with Slovaks around and we are coming and trying to say a few words in Slovak, hi, la 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 la, even offer some cakes and they don't react to us, they ignore us. We'll never integrate. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a problem. I mean, Bratislava is cosmopolitan. Bratislava is not so bad. But try to go somewhere else. They are curious about you for 15 minutes. Where are you from? Are you married here? What is your traditional dish? And sometimes, in my case, I remember Ceausescu. Mm -hmm. So the other Ceausescu was a communist leader of yeah, Romania. Yeah. And the question is like, why did you shoot him at Christmas? And then the conversation is over. Okay. So and the interest no in interest. me is over. Okay. But you know, I'm boring. I'm not married. I don't like Slovak traditional food. I still think that half of Slovak cuisine is actually Austro-Hungarian, Hungarian, and it's not yeah. really. Huh? So you know, I'm not really a good, uh, <laughs> a good person to talk to. So in the moment when to. you say no, Alushki, I'm not a good food, that you are already jeopardized. And sometimes I know more about Slovakia than they do. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, I, I, I can imagine, and. Um, 
But how are you with your Slovak and... Uh, Mm, Slovak uh, is not a problem anymore, and I think that language is not a problem because I, I know many foreigners who have been trying to learn at least the basic. Hi, my name is. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm from la 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 la. So at least a big an icebreaker all always exists. It's a complicated question. I mean, I'm not a beginner. I'm not you know at the early stage of trying to integrate in Slovakia. So there are examples of course when people are trying. Of course I have Slovak friends. This is not a problem. But I'm talking about the general atmosphere in society. Because it depends very much uh, where do you live. If you live in a small community uh, and you are happy, you know, like, uh, I don't know, Italians among Italians, Spaniards among yeah. Spaniards, Greeks among Greeks, uh, I don't know, Poles among Poles, um, and you don't really interfere with the large society uh, because you don't need it or because you don't have the opportunity, then it's very it's it's very Mm, different experience in Slovakia. What, what I figured, I don't know if it's also your opinion, but it takes a bit longer to yep. um, to make friendship. I agree, right? I agree. So then my general tradition, but then at one point when there is a kind of breaking point where something happens and then the relationship becomes much more easy and the conversation as well and also the small talks or whatever thing. There is the, the deep talk that is not... Yeah, that's but everybody has a time limit. You know how many years you have to wait for. That's, that's, yeah. <laughs> so not everybody. Because I, I mm, how can I say, I know a lot of foreigners whom I met here at various occasions who are not in Slovakia anymore. It doesn't matter if Romanians or Italians. Mm-hmm. We have a common person. We know uh, an Italian guy. More people who are uh, like common acquaintances, let's say, plus minus, and they left Slovakia. Some left because of some better job abroad, but many uh, left because of the atmosphere. And they okay. don't say it openly, uh, but that's the true. At least from the Romanian side, from those Romanians uh, who left, I know that this is the case. Uh, they still think that this is okay. Some came with unrealistic expectations, mm-hmm. uh, didn't have experience of living abroad, or they left abroad in London or somewhere else. And of course, Bratislava is not London. But uh, there are some who have a problem with the the atmosphere, this kind of like coldness in a way, like you stay there, I stay here, I say hi, you say hi, let's go, to, maybe we'll have a beer together mm-hmm. talking about football. Why, why, why do you think? Because, the, you know, I found the same kind of uh, impression in uh, basically all the guests I met this interview and also many, the majority of foreigners. Uh, why do you think so? Like, why there is this? Is it like a cultural background, historical background, anything in particular, or the stereotypes you mention about foreigners? So, well, what's the? Mm, I think it's a combination of all this. I think that some people are really afraid of the unknown and they don't know how to talk about it mm. and what kind of conversation to have and. Uh, Some Slovaks, if they don't know too much about your country, mm-hmm. they don't even talk because they think that it's a shame, you know, to to talk about things you don't know. And this is uh, this is a, a kind of inheritance from the schooling system mm-hmm. in Slovakia and communism. And even now, it's like you raise your hand and give an answer only if you know the answer. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter if you think you know it or you think you don't know it. It's just your impression, you know. You just shut up if you don't know the answer, better not to get involved yeah. in conversation. So maybe it's still this kind of like inheritance. Uh, some people um, have their own circle of friends already and they don't get out of it. Uh, so you have to bear in mind that in Bratislava many Slovaks are foreigners in a way because yeah. they moved from eastern Slovakia, from Košice, from you know smaller localities. It's a city of foreigners. It's a city of foreigners, but I realized it was my former flatmates that they felt as strange as I felt sometimes. The only difference was that they spoke the language. Um, you have in Bratislava people from Košice sticking together, people from Prešov sticking together. So. You have a lot of migrants here, like internal migrants yeah. and then external migrants. Um, and if you come from a small community where you know your neighbor, you know your family, two houses away is your grandpa and then is your mom, and 
uh, come to Bratislava and you're lost because the family ties are somewhere back in Eastern yeah. Slovakia. So they first struggle to their own uh, migration issue and then we are on top of it or extra. But of course, it's an individual in a little story and I think that the younger generation is much more open like uh, those who are in 20s you know I'm always joking that I can smell you know when a Slovak lift the broad there is a new generation the one which is well traveled well educated that has no problem but we might not find them in Slovakia you mm-hmm. know they are abroad Czech right, Republic for example the experience as a foreigner is already bringing you the need from time to you know get in touch with different people and you know try to you know get reach out for help so that actually makes you more much more let's say open and minded and social so but a, you know what's funny i have a very interesting experience with multiculturality in healthcare mm-hmm. i went to on many occasions helping uh, romanians with, with uh, language issues and stuff like this and um uh, The only place where nobody looked ugly at us, apart from one nurse, but she had she was angry <laughs> for other reasons, uh, the one who were trying to use foreign languages and trying to talk to us was in healthcare. And um, I even there was a young doctor who spoke English with no problem. And then I came with a kid, not my kid, but with a kid, the kid of one friend of mine to a checkup. And I met her again and she was like, Oh, you know, I was so happy that I have the chance to, to speak foreign languages. Uh, the experience is varied. <laughs> But unfortunately, politicians, I think, have a very negative, very negative contribution to this negative so atmosphere. So they're not definitely helping the integration no. in many, no. much of the political message, right? No, no. Give me an example of Slovak politician who is making positive statements about foreigners. I'm not talking about we need Ukrainians and Serbs because we need workers for our factories, Mm -hmm. but we need them short term. They work and then we send them back. Good luck with that. We'll see how it will work now that there are uh, regional, local elections uh, coming in November Mm -hmm. and foreigners, because foreigners can vote only for local elections, regional elections and elections for the European Parliament. They are not used to having foreigners here. You know, they are not used to... They really think that foreigners are not interested here. And I, I remember an amazing example in Martin. They have this medical faculty and they had a lot... They have still have a lot of uh, students from Norway. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Nordic countries, they have a completely different mentality when it comes to community. So there is an association of uh, Norwegian students and they wanted to do something for the community in Martin. Because they are used to do something for their little town, bigger town mm-hmm. in Norway. And they approached the city hall, trying to ask. We wanted to paint benches, you know, trees and something. Slovaks were in shock. First of all, I guess they thought that Norwegians want some money for it. Okay. And second, I guess that there was a first time when somebody approached them actually volunteering for something. <laughs> But in the end, uh, in the end, it worked well because in the end they found a way. Of course, the Norwegian embassy went there and they talk about and help and a lot. Them. And there are Norwegian funds that help, you know, reconstruct castles and mm-hmm. stuff like this in Slovakia. But this is um, a good example because it shows that ro- locals really believe that foreigners are here just to work, sometimes steal jobs, mm-hmm. you know. And that's all, as if it's always like a temporary thing, you know, only passing by. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that many foreigners are really interested in what's happening in their community. For example, we, at the radio, we receive some questions from some foreigners living here. How can I volunteer? Could you please send us some links? I want to volunteer for some organizations. Mm-hmm or uh, practical questions about things like, uh, not this kind of like, I, who wants to walk my dogs or stuff like this, but because they are used to it, to do it in their countries, they want to do it in Slovakia yeah. too. Of course. And we found some organizations that's like, oh, but they don't speak Slovak. I was like, okay, you want to paint trees, you know, or collect garbage. Really, how much Slovak do you want to use when you pick up garbage from the forest? give me a break but again is this like oh mm. i think that also slovaks lack curiosity about the other okay. and it's not only about foreigners but also about their ethnic minorities neighbors it's my personal opinion i don't know if it's uh, maybe shared by others but i mm. think they lack curiosity about the other it's very limited 
And what, what something uh, positive because I have been only critical or negative. Show me. So <laughs> ask me something positive. <laughs> something bad. Tell me about uh, your uh, your experience as you know a citizen of uh, you know the, the world, the, the world, and also living in Bratislava and uh, you know working here. So how how is your day? And uh, you know what? How do you spend your your time as well when you're not working? We turn to small dogs. <laughs> Joking. No, I think I, I love journalism, uh, and I think that journalism is a very interesting point right now, with everything going on. Okay, I'm not going to get into fake news and how technology changed everything, mm -hmm. but I think that uh, it's at a very interesting point. Uh, I love biking, cycling, and I love the. Uh, Danube shores, I don't know how to translate them in, in English, they are the special forests on the Danube corridor. Uh, from Petrozalka you go towards the Hungarian uh, mm -hmm. border and some of them are also towards the Austrian border. So I love those forests, really, I love it. Unfortunately, so there is like a highway hike, going there? that way. You can't hike, it's flat it's actually, walking, right? walking <laughs> by, bike, yeah, by bike, by bike. But unfortunately there is a highway being built there. <laughs> So you need to cross it to get to the other It's side. not even built. It's just destroying the forest at the moment. But anyway, I'm not a driver, so maybe drivers can have a different opinion. But uh, I feel sorry for the for the trees there. Mm -hmm. I've never thought that I could feel that I could have such an environmental, deep emotional connection. Mm -hmm. But really, it really looks sad. Because, you know, they cut the trees as if you are cutting your hair using this machine, like, you know, like a punk thing. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so this is what I like. Um, now, I like sports. I like a lot of things. You like and the tennis, right? I like tennis. And I, now because, you know, local elections are coming, I feel sorry that in Bratislava are so few public courts. Not only for tennis, but also there are basketball courts hidden somewhere, uh, you know, in Petržalka, mm -hmm. you know, covered or surrounded by these huge concrete blocks of flats. So if you don't live there right there, so you see it from your balcony, basically you don't have a clue that mm -hmm. they are there. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a pity because they are now reconstructed and they're really cool. So I think the Bratislava deserves more like public uh, pools, public uh, tennis courts, public uh, basketball courts everything sport facilities look how many empty so there is, spaces like you say there is more demand than yeah it's a bigger demand it's a big one now uh, how many i don't know about your foreigners but uh, your friends but my friends uh, rent a, a place from a school if the director wants to give them uh, i mean if you want to play badminton or something you have to book something and uh, usually mm -hmm. it's booked by a company so empty sp slots are at midnight not midnight but in the evening or six o'clock in the morning. Football so, grounds are very yeah, hard to yeah, find. Yeah, so I feel the Bratislava really, really needs more um, open, free spaces for everybody. Many are using old, uh, old schools or places yeah. that are already there, but there is like, like school playgrounds. new facilities, new <laughs> playground. There could be more demand. I, per my experience, I think uh, with colleagues and so on, uh, there are weird hours where folks are meeting, right? And mm -hmm. then you go in weird kind of football field is not mm -hmm. something like okay let's go and I didn't even book it but for sure mm -hmm. we're gonna find something it never happens something like that usually mm -hmm. yeah you need to do it in advance that, that, that's true and uh, do you go to office by bike or you I tried but um, there is a part of the route which I have to cross heavy traffic mm -hmm. and I'm so scared really I'm so scared because some some roads are so narrow that even if the bus driver wants to be okay uh, there is no space and I feel like it's like millimeters from me you know so I and I don't want to drive on the pavement I mean on the uh, what do you call it walk uh, the walking way like the, the walkway from you know to share the 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 place with some yeah. passerbys because it happened to me that I was and one kid ran and I, I just had an accident. I mean, the kid was yeah. okay, I was okay, but I felt story afterwards because, you know, how small kids and dogs are, they run all the place. So I, don't, I didn't want to go on the pavement, mm -hmm. like sharing with uh, pedestrians. And there are no, some of those uh, biking paths are a joke. Yeah, they're um, they're uh, just, just illusion. drawn. <laughs> what do you like about Slovakia? Now I'll be like a bit stereotypical nature, mm -hmm. 
but not the high Tatras and not all this like uh, iconic uh, places, but some less unknown places. I like the, f- you know, I have to explain one thing. I had a very big respect for Slovaks for the way that they turned around, you know, after mature years and stuff like this, when they started the reforms in the 20s, you know, they joined the European Union, it was a lot of enthusiasm, mm-hmm. let's do it, let's show to the world or to Europe that we can do it, you know. And I really, really, like, cheered up. And, uh, you know, I really, really had very deep um, admiration. Then, unfortunately, the situation changed a bit. And... Uh, So this is one of the moments which I like about Slovakia. I hope it will happen in the future too when people can get together for a common goal which is higher than my interest in, you know, buying a house or a car or something. This is a thing which I admired very much. I hope it's not only one moment in time. I hope that it can happen. But th- this is actually an interesting year for, for journalism and for, for politics. You know? It's like there are several changes happen at least people get there for a common purpose uh, um, than usually I'll talk as a private person right now because I'm still a journalist <laughs> so I'm trying to talk as a private person right now um, mm, it's debatable whether the change really happened Okay. I mean if you mean Kutiak's murder we were all shocked even people who did not know him personally I did not know him personally mm-hmm. I was reading his articles but I was I didn't know I did not know him personally the fact that somebody get gets killed in Slovakia in 2018 is shocking of course um, but I'm not so sure you know I went to all these protests as a journalist I covered them I spoke to loads of people and I found a lot of like uh, nostalgia of those people who went uh, took to the streets in 1989 okay. and then they came back and they put so much hope in the young generation you know young people will change young people don't are not afraid i am not so optimistic i think that um, I think that if young people have to choose between staying here and fighting and going to the Czech Republic, which is mm-hmm. across the border or even further, but let's say Czech Republic because it's the same language, I'm afraid that many will choose Czech Republic. It's I know a lot of mm, people who are really fighting, but I think that the enthusiasm or the anger or the... How do you want to call it? That was here in February, March, April, Mm -hmm. June is over. And, you know, unfortunately, I have the experience from my home country, Romania, where we had a fire in a discotheque uh, two years ago, and the government fell. Uh, People took to the streets, promised to fight corruption, blah, 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 tra-la. There were elections. With one square full of people. Yeah, yeah, but even even before we had it, even before we had it, and uh, wow, we had elections. Had elections 2016, and 39.6%. This was a turn now, 39.6, not even 40%, or 0.4, not even 40%. And of course, the same party won. <laughs> and to me, I spoke to my friends. Some didn't have time to go to vote. Some were disappointed by politics. Some didn't care because they left Romania and they don't care anymore. And I'm really, 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 uh, bit, not afraid, but I have this on the back of my mind, you know. That at the end of the day, how do we say in Romania, uh, memory is very short. People have short memories, not mm. only in Romania, but people have short memory. Yeah, what would you hope for? For Slovakia? Mm-hmm. Oh, it's a long list of things. <laughs> oh. um, I hope that the atmosphere will, will someday, not, just come, not, not the come back, but the atmosphere will be again like... Uh, like the one I found in 2001, two, you know, that enthusiasm, a, a vision, let's do things, we have a goal, let's go there. Of course, not everybody was like this, but uh, the atmosphere in society as such was like, let's have a goal, let's go there. 
um, and um, this is what I it's funny in a way that I want <laughs> something back from the past you know like a nostalgic almost thing okay. but this is what I want and to open much more not to be afraid of you know foreigners or Roma or Hungarians or whatever wind water fire mm-hmm. <laughs> so perhaps it's um, uh, it, that particular uh, feeling that uh, so everyone at one point is agreeing on a certain kind of common good for the community and then they are managed to organize at that time and to move something forward but at the same time you should have always perhaps a kind of uh, leadership that agrees with the same point yeah. otherwise you will never get to a change and also I wish for Slovakia to stop for lost Slovaks to stop uh, searching for an um, iconic father figure somebody who protects them and defends them and promises to feed them and take care of them. Mm-hmm. Such things are, do not exist in reality, first of all. Mm-hmm. And second, those who try to be such figures in history uh, did not have a positive effect on the country. Mm-hmm. And also, I think that it's time for Slovakia to look forward and uh, stop looking back at what Hungarians did to them, Czechs did to them, I don't know who else, now migrants do to them. So I think to be a bit more self-confidence and looking forward with, okay, this is who we are, mm-hmm. let's go. And this idea of like, oh, we are a small country, nobody actually takes us seriously. Uh, I don't like this thing. There are smaller countries that could do big things in in Europe, in the world, so... So you, from, from a journalist perspective, how is the quality of journalism here and uh, what do you think about the, uh, you know, how it's organized now currently? So I think that the problem with the headaches that journalists have in Slovakia are very common to what journalists have all over Europe, plus minus. Uh, of course, of course, one question uh, relates to the finding the right economic model to make a profit or make money to be sustainable. It's an online era. Uh, I work for the public uh, radio. I'm a strong believer in the public media. Mm-hmm. Um, that means free and uh, for the common good? Public service, which means... Because, you know, if you are a commercial entity, of course, you have to make money. Uh, and uh, sometimes uh, you have to cover topics which are not... And sometimes you have to uh, reject topics which are not very profitable. Let's put it in a, in a, in a raw way. Uh, While well, the public service can give a voice to some minority topics, be it culture, be it minorities like ethnic minorities, uh, which are not attractive to to some online news site. Hey, so I, that's why I really believe in the public media role. I think that all. The mature countries, mature societies, mature democracies should have a strong public media. I remember when in your home country Berlusconi was trying to make a, a joke out of Rai, mm-hmm. which is a public, uh, which I watch by the way, and some, I love it. <laughs> I love, I watch Digi Due, all the when, uh, and also sometimes I'm amused. You still have this like grand shows, you know, Sanremo. It's yeah, like from yeah, another yeah. era, but it's good because you know for it's a commercial. Valletta, like but it's canzone italiana, you know, it's supporting yeah. something which a commercial station may not be interested in because yeah. it can't sell enough advertising space or uh, you have very long shows you know you have this like presa diretta it's yeah. just like one hour show a commercial TV station will not allow one hour discussion on a hot current affairs topic mm-hmm. I'm not talking now about the quality or the lack of quality no, I'm talking about the uh, you know the how do you structure the program uh, if you take well, BBC, it's definitely not the role model Italy as a media. No, but it's an example platform. of how politicians are trying to use it. Yeah. How you can use TV to attract voters, yeah. um, and also I think that if you look at BBC, for example, with all the ups and downs that it has had, it's still a pillar of the society. 
of course, a different culture, the British culture, but it's a pillar of society. It's the BBC. And as a foreigner, what what are the media you? Of course, you're on radio, but what are the media you are digesting? I read most of them, all of them, almost, apart from uh, some uh, conspirational websites, proven. Mm-hmm. I, I have to check all of them. Did like you? it or not, I have to check all of them. Yes, uh, but do you think, you know, also foreigners, you know, they people are aware about Slovak uh, actuality or what is happening or not? Uh, not uh, uh, I think they are now. I don't know which is the source for them. Uh, I guess that the two of them are Slovak spectators and I hope that also our station. Um, yeah, it took a long time until the gods came to the conclusion that yes, uh, there are foreigners in Slovakia who deserve to learn something about our country, by the way. Uh, and we have this and this and this outlets. Mm-hmm. Of course, the European Union also had a, a role to push it a bit. Yeah. But finally it happened and I'm glad it happened. I don't want to promote my radio station too much, but uh, I think it deserves a bit more product. I promotion. mean, this is a my Slovak experience, most of it's <laughs> foreigners, so, yeah. and this is in English, so it's, even if you don't speak Slovak, you can understand, yeah, yeah, yeah. so, so uh, it's a good yeah. source of information. So you, you say it's also public? Yeah, and we try from time to time to go more into those communities, to talk to those people, to present the life of those people living here. Mm. Not everybody is willing to, <laughs> to talk to us, but from time to time we do it, um, yeah, we do it. Yeah. And we want to do it even more. What would you change about Slovakia? I think more openness is one thing. And if I have to change something in my attitude towards Slovakia or my life in Slovakia, I think I should uh, be a bit more phlegmatic and uh, not to get uh, too emotionally involved in some things and in some... uh, you know, sometimes I pick up fights, uh, like at the mm-hmm. bank, somebody didn't speak Slovak and the lady was rude to a person and I tried to help the other person and she was rude and I was really like, then I was aggressive towards her, I called the boss, I mm-hmm. said that this is racism and so on. <laughs> sometimes maybe I should just be a bit more, more calm and not get so much involved in things. Mm-hmm. As experience, uh, compare maybe with the, the, the Romania you come from, like the, the services and uh, you know, I think they're the same. The city. I think they're the same for more Eastern, from a communist countries, Eastern Europe. I think plus minus they are the same. But you know, I haven't lived in Romania for so many years that you know, if I want, if I go once per year, of course I pick up a fight with somebody there, but um, mm-hmm. some office or somewhere. Mm-hmm. But I don't know, so I, I'm not living there. I, I didn't live. I haven't lived there for a long time, so I don't know how it is. I can't compare it. You go back from time to time mm-hmm. to visit. What are the main things your? Uh, friends from, from there are interested about Slovakia or what they know about this place? It's interesting. I think that most of my friends have already visited Slovakia or came to visit me. Uh, they don't have a lot of questions about Slovakia. Usually I spend not I spend little time there, so we talk about us, you know, we're not mm-hmm. talking about we talk about Romanian politics and other things. I, no, we don't talk too much about Slovakia. Mm-mm. Before, when I came here, there was still somebody that was calling Czechoslovakia, right? So there, there seems something like there was a moment where uh, you studied geography at the school, and then that's actually, your knowledge stays there and doesn't get updated. Right? But you, you'll be surprised how many letters from the European Commission I got with the address, my name, blah, 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 and then it was... Um, Bratislava, La Republic Czech, which is a Czech Republic. <laughs> so even the European Commission can get it wrong. What uh, What are the the topics you are working on right, that are more interesting for you? Um, I have uh, I have become more interested in healthcare uh, in the past maybe three years. Uh, I cover economics. I cover politics. Uh, mm, expats, let's say, in Slovakia or migration, uh, ethnic groups. Uh, Now, sometimes we are a bit understaffed, so I have to pick up whatever is uh, is needed. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sometimes I have more time to do the stories as I wish to, like in-depth, talking to a lot of people. 
But I have to say that um, I had a, a kind of revelation, you know, sometimes uh, you talk so much with politicians and um, representatives and blah, blah, mm-hmm. blah. And uh, then you talk to normal people. And I'm not talking about a vox pop on the street, like talking to people. But talking to people in a certain area, like, for example, nurses, but regular nurses, nurses who go to the hospital every day, not the representative of a chamber, yeah? Or doctors, like young doctors starting their career, not the association of blah, blah, blah. And it's always, always refreshing, and uh, I always like it very much. So my, my goal is to talk less to... Uh, higher ups <laughs> and more to uh, those down to earth <laughs> let's call it this way sometimes it's very difficult to make those ordinary let's call people to talk and this is the art let's say or the challenge I get frustration many times and uh, I have to use all my charming techniques mm-hmm. like Sometimes they get pity, they take pity on me. Sometimes they explain me more because I'm a foreigner and I have to, ex- they have <laughs> a back- like, a, like a long background introduction. But um, yeah, so this is my goal to talk more to ordinary people. Even if, you know, sometimes you may have a feeling that they are not really representative for the big picture mm-hmm. because, of course, everybody talks about their own experience. Yeah. But sometimes I think that. Uh, it's much more refreshing because in Slovakia there is a problem with data there is a lot of like my impression my feeling rather than my data mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, everybody talks about feeling nowadays on feeling, media, yeah. right? mom bought it so yeah there is one thing that I uh, I would like to know also what you think about because I, I was I think the other day, you know, going, I'm driving, so I'm going back and forth from, mm-hmm. uh, from Bratislava to, you know, to the east area. And, uh, but also walking in the street. One, I, I, when I, you get also from Austria or from, uh, all of the, I remember my the Italian environment. Mm-hmm. One thing there is everywhere here in Slovakia are these continuous big advertisement and billboards that are huge and big. And for it's me, called visual smog. Kind of, it's a vi- big visual smog, right? That if I could, I would just, you know, just put them in some areas, but it would make the environment much more beautiful. I don't know if it's the same impression of yours. Yeah, sometimes I have this feeling, and I know that the, there is a campaign against them. There are activists that would like to to have less and less and less, because also they are a bit dangerous. I think that. Uh, I read somewhere that you know drivers are you know looking after <laughs> some sexy lady doing some commercial for some whatever and casino that is causing accidents and not looking yes. at the you know the road ahead. Um, I don't know why they appeared. I I suspect that there was some deregulation and some yeah. people who wanted to make some money because you pay a fee if you want to uh, you know to post this like huge billboard on a particular plot mm-hmm. of land. I think that there was like a bit of chaos when it comes to regulation or to uh, land management, let's call it like this. Maybe it's cheaper for advertisers, I don't know. But it's true that some of them are huge and are ugly because it's a huge, huge pillar made of, uh, I don't know, I guess uh, iron or maybe even steel. And then on top of uh, even, it Even a, a graphic designer, I really appreciate some of them because I really like... There are, I think there are some very good genius in advertising here that they do mm-hmm. very beautiful posters and beautiful. But even if they are beautiful in itself, uh, it, they are, you know the color can never be harmonized with what is around. That are mm-hmm. buildings and trees. And so. And also, the nature is really beautiful. If you go to eastern Slovakia, yeah, uh, there are some very very nice landscapes on the way. You know, some lakes, some of them are artificial, of course, some hills because Slovakia is mostly a hilly country, and it's really beautiful. This uh, this environment, like natural environment, this is what I like. It's a very beautiful area. That's that's true. And it's a pity that you have like commercial for um, I don't know some cleaning products. <laughs> yeah, I agree with this. Food you don't like, or what's your favorite <laughs> Slovak food? Uh, you know, I was critical because I think that there are, I doubt that there is something which is typical Slovak. I think okay. that there is a it's a melting pot of so many actually cuisines here that mm-hmm. uh, you know they were a part of Austro-Hungary in Austro-Hungarian Empire so there is a lot of influence from the Hungarian cuisine like 
goulash and paprika yeah, and stuff. Yeah. Some of them are even found in Romania because, of course, we also had a part uh, of are our there country. Something, is there something in Romania common to us? Yeah, that's a yeah, yeah. What is it? So, Kolosvarska kapusta is not Slovak. Kolosvar is a Hungarian name of Kluznapoka in Romania. Okay. It's a Austro-Hungarian dish, if you want. Um, you know, I did a story uh, about... Um, colon cancer this is basically but part of that story was uh, I spoke to an ethnologist who uh, is an expert on food cuisine okay. and it was an, she even published some books and it was amazing how she described how the Slovak eating habits changed in in connection with the political changes okay Slovakia was a rural country So people living uh, in rural areas usually eat a lot of things which I had around their house, like a lot of vegetables, a lot of beans, green beans or normal beans, a lot of cereals made what, you know, what they could grow there. And they were not eating so much meat because a cow was important. You know, the cow gave you milk, the pig also, you know, you cut it once, you killed it once per mm-hmm. year when there was some event, a lot of chickens around. So potatoes, a lot of potatoes. So basically the, the Slovak traditional food, not the one that we see right now like advertised, but the Slovak traditional food was very healthy. A lot of uh, lentil soup, bean soup, spinach, vegetables. Yeah. But of course, communists came to power. And when the communists came to power, they started to industrialize a lot Slovakia. And a lot of uh, people moved from the rural areas to towns to work in factories. And in factories, they started to uh, eat in this like canteens, Jedalen, the nightmare of everybody almost. Um, so basically, they had this like uh, mass uh, lunch, let's call it like this. And uh, their habits changed. And it is, if you can look at statistics, And you can look at the historical events mm-hmm. and there is a correlation between the in- incidence increase in cases of digestive diseases, certain okay. various diseases, and the, uh, the social and economic changes. Suddenly, you know, in, in the village you had a small house and you had lunch together. You know, on Sunday you had like came to go to church, come back and have this typical lunch. When you move to Košice or to Bratislava or to Žilina or to Banska Bistrica and work in a factory, you got a flat maybe, but there was not this like family lunch was not really like it used to be. And then of course this like uh, uh, pre-cooked meals were introduced after 1989 and again the situation got even worse. So If you look at the Slovak traditional dish, it's not really like exotic, it's not really, but it's healthy in terms of nutrition. Like halushki, you mean? Or? Not really halushki, you know, those, those halushki are not so bad, but they make it in a bad way because most of halushki that you get now in Bratislava are actually frozen halushkis, yeah. which they put it, they're not like homemade, you know, like using this uh, pastry yeah. and everything and then you know there was uh, awesome healthy bacon on top I would they say. were eating bacon but they were eating bacon only between you know when they were fasting so between uh, christmas and uh, when they started fasting yeah. for easter so there were very certain t- periods of uh, year when you were eating they were not eating klobasi yeah. every day So, because that animal was very important, <laughs> you know, that cow, for example, the, or, the, or the sheep, you know, they were there for a particular reason, to give milk, to make cheese out of it and so on, to kill it and, you know, grill it. So, uh, it's a sad story in this so respect. So, it wasn't the, the, the whole tradition, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, even it if is. it's still considered as tradition, yeah. but perhaps it's like, what, one generation ago? Uh, from the 60s to 50s, so it's basically maybe two plus minus two generations already. But I like some of the soups, like traditional soups, but made uh, really like, you know, by some grandma somewhere. I went somewhere on a business trip and really we went to eat village uh, kind of kirchma and they're also cooking something. But of course, they had a lot of like 
baked things and baked like sausages and mm-hmm. stuff but they also had like a homemade soup it was yeah. in eastern Slovakia which is closer to the borscht that Ukrainians and Russians have yeah. so it was this like thicker soup vegetable soup but thicker the one which is close to what I have in Romania for example and it was amazing but you can't find that one in Bratislava I think so there are some things which I like also in the Slovak cuisine but Bratislava became a bit more cosmopolitan recently there yeah, are a many lot of more restaurants, restaurants from and yeah, it's true. And I like a few of them, are really nice, really nice. It's still not exactly the the variety which would expect. They still try to also adjust it to Slovak, mm-hmm. you know, taste. But there are a few which I'm not going to make now commercials, but <laughs> but there are a few which are nice. And I like, for example, this Hungarian halasle, which yeah. is like a fish soup. Mm-hmm. And behind the radio building, there is one place which where they make it very good, very good. Very it's homemade. You could feel it that the fish is real. It's not from some, you know, some dried uh, elements created. genetically or some dried, <laughs> you know, things. So there are some places. The problem with Bratislava is that to me, at least, once I like a place, I go there and I eat. And then the next season, I realize that the owner was changed, uh, the owner changed or mm-hmm. the cook changed. And it's not there anymore. So the food changes as well. Yeah. I have maybe a la- la- last question from you uh, that uh, I, I, you know, as a... Um, uh, as a woman, how do you think is the you know, role of a woman, a woman here in Slovakia and uh, how are the you know, men treating and what what the other You know, I've always thought that Slovakia is a country of women. Okay. Um, I think that the women are really managing this country. Unfortunately, there are some conservative whatever waves so that's why you see in the front line men which in my opinion are some some of them if you look at politicians are weak actually mm-hmm. but they try to pretend to be macho or whatever but I think this is a country of women I don't want to offend men but if you talk about in terms of like conservative conservative attitudes and stuff I really believe that this is a country of women women run the country but behind the scenes somehow and the fir- in the first line on the first first line you see men which is a bit unfortunate that's interesting and usually men don't like it I think if I have to judge by what happened to former Prime Minister Iveta Radichova mm-hmm. or through other ministries ministers I know who are women I can name more mm-hmm. this is my personal opinion so there is potentially more respect for women at this point, right? If it's a country of women or uh, there is I no... I think there is a lot of violence against women in Slovakia okay. in terms of like uh, domestic violence. It doesn't go reported. It goes unreported. So that's why in statistics you may not have it. Uh, they change the legislation, so uh, it should be more. Uh, but it's not like in Scandinavian country where it's very well defined what it means this and what it means this, and we really investigate it. Unfortunately, I still believe that in many many parts of Slovakia it's still normal to receive a few. Mm-hmm. Um, it's linked with alcoholism. It's linked with various things. So I think this is a this is a story which is really like a bit under the radar. Radar, I think. Um, I think that there is a problem with sectors which are strongly feminized, like healthcare and education, mm-hmm. which in Slovakia are dominated by women. And there are economic studies showing that when there is a sector which is strongly dominated by women, the salaries tend to be low. Okay. Uh, so this is a problem. The feminization of healthcare is a problem, and uh, it's only the, the open secret that young doctors are told, "Don't go into surgery. You're a woman. Come on, you want to have a child? I go to pediatrics, mm-hmm. go to um, you know eyes and throat, and uh, mm. come on, not surgery, not surgery." No, uh, so. There are things. I have it from many doctors. They just don't go public with this, you know. So And they prefer to go abroad. That, that's, we are coming back to that point, you know. If I have to do it in Slovakia to fight for this thing in Slovakia or go to Germany where I, they're okay, relatively okay with me or to Switzerland where they're relatively okay with me being a woman in surgery, why don't go there? Why should I fight with the 8, 19-year-old, not 19, 
a very old gentleman who happens to be the head of the department yeah. and thinks that women are not good for uh, mm. surgery. So yeah, there are a lot of uh, gender things. And of course you have very conservative parts of society, like the coalition of pro-family, where they think that women sh are on this earth only to make children. And extremes, sad extremes. But you have them in Romania too. I'm sure that there are some in Italy too. Yeah. So I think it's not only a Slovak phenomenon. It's, it's very hardcore conservative groups are all over the place. I think do you think everywhere. it's more connected with the religious uh, groups or it's... Um, Some of them are, religions? openly. They are endorsed by the Catholic Church in Slovakia. Some of them are not. Some of them are really more connected to the theory of conspiracy, like anti-vaccination campaign. I think it's really connected to something else. But, yeah, now everybody will, will hate me. I'm ready for some hate speech. <laughs> no, but uh, it, it's... Um Interesting for me to you know to, to hear from you and uh, uh, you know I always I still consider that there are many steps to be done in society right where uh, to, to to reach equality and such um, but I I feel perhaps compared to my experience that Slovakia in this has more openness right to perhaps to also thanks to the communists where you had more of uh, opportunities also for women to mm -hmm. you know, do everything but i i, I, can, I cannot speak about in it, communist right? that opportunity that uh, the equality between men and women in communism was on paper okay and the reality but if reality. you look at least in romania if you look for example of women's rep reproductive rights you know there was a disaster so the equality for men and women in, in communism no. no 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 mm -mm. it's an illusion Oh, let's be glad that anyway this period <laughs> is ended. Okay, and let's hope for. It's not gonna come back. So thanks so much for sharing. It was my pleasure. Uh, any anywhere people can reach out to you or listen to your um, activities or except for the radio is anything you, where you, you wanna drive. So uh, I'll just say our website is www.rsi.sk and we are the foreign broadcast of the Slovak Public Radio. So we, ha we are also on Facebook, on Twitter, on Google+, on Tumblr, on YouTube, all over the, the place. But I can also tune in from the radio, right? Yeah, of course, you can listen on the internet. And we also broadcast in Bratislava and its surroundings on 98.9 FM. So you have a FM radio yeah. and you don't live in Petrozalka close to the Austrian border. Yeah. <laughs> You can tune into normal radio. It's uh, the mm, English language broadcast. It's at uh, 6.30 and 8.30. But we also have a German language, Slovak, mm -hmm. French, Spanish, Russian. It's for Slovaks, foreigners. It's for Slovaks, foreigners, everybody who speaks and that particular language. Yeah. And <laughs> everyone around the world that wants to know so what is happening here. Exactly. Cool. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you everyone for listening to my Slovak experience. See you at the next interview. Till then, have fun, share and enjoy.